Okay, so now we'll proceed to our third case. For this case, okay, it's a 40-year-old Indian lady presented to you with complaint of palpitation and coughing out blood. Okay, we call it as hemoptysis for one day duration. It was associated with mild shortness of breath, which is the difficulty of breathing, as well as chest pain, which was worsened by taking deep breath. On further history, okay, when you ask further, your patient claimed that she has been having right leg swelling and redness for the past three days since traveling back from Kuala Lumpur to Kota Baru. And when the patient arrived at your yellow zone, you decided to do a 12 lead ECG. So an ECG was done, and this is the ECG of your particular patient. So what are the findings? All right, as you can see from the ECG, there is what we call as a sinus tachycardia, meaning that the heart rate is rapid and more than 100 beats per minute. You can also see what we call as a right bundle branch pattern, at, especially at our right-sided chest lid, and also T-wave inversions in the right recordial leads, which is our lead V1 to V3, as well as lead number 3. So con considering the presentation, the risk factors of prolonged immobilization, the presence of unilateral lower limb swelling, and these ECG changes, our provisional diagnosis will be acute pulmonary embolism. Okay, so what are other examples of ECG that you can see in acute pulmonary embolism? This is one of the examples. So the findings are, there is what we call as a RBBB, which is our right bundle branch block. There is also extreme right axis deviation which is more than 180 degrees. And you can also see what is the classical ECG changes in acute pulmonary embolism, although quite rare, but it is what we call as a classical ECG findings, which is S1, Q3, and also T3. What do we mean by that? It's the presence of S wave at lead one, presence of Q-wave at lead number 3, and presence of T-inversion at lead number 3. Apart from that, we can also see T-wave inversions at V1 to V4 as well as lead 3. So what are the key ECG findings in pulmonary embolism? The most common okay, is actually sinus tachycardia, so don't be surprised if your patient only exhibit sinus tachycardia as the ECG findings because it is actually the most common abnormality that we find in acute pulmonary embolism. What are other findings? You can also see complete or incomplete right bundle branch block pattern. You can also see right ventricular strain pattern. Why do we have right ventricular strain pattern? Because in pulmonary embolism, you will expect it to have acute pulmonary hypertension, which will backflow to your right side of the heart. So you may have the wave inversion in the right precordial leads, which is our lead V1 until V4, plus minus inferior leads, which is our lead 2, 3, and also AVF. Apart from that, you may have right axis deviation, and you may also find a dominant R wave in lead V1. Other than that, okay, we are expected to also see, especially in chronic pulmonary embolism, you may have evidence of right arterial enlargement, in which in the ECG, you may see a prominent P wave, also known as a P pulmonale. And as, as I said earlier, the classical findings is our S1, Q3 and T3 patterns. These are our deep S wave in lead 1, Q wave in lead 3, and inverted T wave in lead 3 as well. It's a classical finding. Unfortunately, it is neither sensitive nor specific for pulmonary embolism. Other than that, we can also see atrial tachyarrhythmia, namely our atrial fibrillation, atrial flutter, 
or it could also be atrial tachycardia. And lastly, it's a non-specific STT changes, including ST depression as well as ST depression. So that concludes our case number three.